I'm here with Captain Captain William Hoos, uh, that was served in the United States Coast Guard. Uh, uh, when were you born? I was born in uh, uh, October 31, 1916. Okay. Uh, uh, that what makes me 87 years old. 87. Uh, what years did you serve in the military? The war years, 1941 to 1945. Okay. And uh, but I served as a uh, this uh, the pilot association that I was working for, piloting deep sea gun ships in and out of New York Harbor, was called an essential industry. They didn't touch anything that we were doing. They just let us operate the way we were, but under Navy uh, orders. Okay. For instance, I was, uh, New York was the biggest port on the East Coast during World War II. We mm -hmm. were assembling convoys, and we had in New York, people didn't know about it, but we had an anti-submarine net that went across the Narrows, uh, separating the lower harbor, the upper harbor of New York, just below the Narrows, where the Narrows Bridge is today. That net gate kept any submarines out of New York Harbor. Okay. And it also kept, you also had to have permission to go through that net. There was an opening about 300 feet wide, and it was all uh, strung across with floats with chain hanging down, a chain fence, heavy, heavy chain fence, so a submarine could never get through there. But a ship with a certain signal could get through that that opening. Uh, what about uh, what about? It was American? called the net gate. Okay. What about American submarines? Would they uh, would they need to they go through were, there at all? An American submarine, uh, each one of these ships that passed through the net gate had a pilot on board, and I was part of the pilot business. A pilot goes on board of a ship and uh, either come inbound or outbound mm -hmm. and takes command of the ship. Is responsible for the ship's position at all time that he's in charge of the ship. If he's not in the right position, two very bad things can happen. One, he would be aground. Number two, he would be in a collision with another ship. Okay. And, uh, uh, speak yeah. uh, during your time in the war, did you ever, how many, uh, how many submarines would you stop? Would any, what? uh, would any would any submarines try and get through there, or did the Germans? No, no, it? it was it was a safety measure. Yeah, it was just a safety measure. Okay. But every pilot that piloted a ship in and out had to have permission and had to have a time to go through that net gate. Don't forget, we were forming in New York Harbor, mm -hmm. huge big convoys, and the convoys would all have to go out together with loaded ships mm -hmm. for material and military goods and stuff for the, for the war effort. Okay. And those same ships would come back in convoy empty. But they were all, it was all arranged ahead of time. The pilots and the captains, when they were forming a convoy in New York Harbor, they were given a time to pass through that net gate, okay. so it was agreed on by the, with the captain and with the with the uh, pilot, just when they would go through. And they were given five minutes intervals. Every five minutes, another loaded ship went through this little narrow, 300-foot wide gate. Um, out of the convoys you sent out, how many uh, how many would come back? Most of them. Well. We had constant movement in and out. I can only tell you that we broke a record in New York that still stands. In one 24-hour period, we handled 262 vessels. 
Wow. Now we did that with a hundred pilots. So you could see that the pilots would get off a, an outbound ship and be brought back in for, or wait out, to, out, out at sea on the pilot boat to bring another one in. But in the case of convoys, they were all one way. We'd have some pilots go out to sea, get off a ship out in the ocean. Then with a fast launch, be brought back to be put on another ship on the same convoy. If we had over a hundred, we had a hundred pilots, and if we had over a hundred ships sailing at one time, pilots had to repeat at the, oh well. Uh, where would the, uh, most of these war goods that you would send out in these convoys, they would, uh, where would most of them go? Talk loud, I can't hear you. <clears throat> most of the convoys that went out there, when, uh, where would they go? Where would they go? Yeah. Across the sea, across the ocean. Well, uh, to where would they drop the stuff off? Murmansk. Do you know, have you ever heard of Murmansk? Yeah. No, I haven't. Okay. Well, Check to see if that's recorded. Due to the heavy uh, attack by submarines, of Germ German submarines, they were convoys, which meant that these ships traveled in a bunch, mm -hmm. protected on all four sides by fighting ships because the submarines would attack and sink the ships even in convoy. But there, there, were, there were convoy escorts, they called them. Mm -hmm. These were ships with, uh, like, destroyed, specially built to defend the, the freight ships against the submarine attack by the Germans. Okay. Or any other surface vessel. Mm -hmm. Um, after after BE Day, what uh, what happened after what after that well, for the, the Pacific War effort? We went back to our normal routine of, of service, and fortunately, uh, I was a pilot when New York was the busiest ship in the world. That meant it had more tonnage than any other harbor in the world. Wow. We moved more harbor in and out. After the war, the Marshall Plan came into being. I don't know whether you've ever heard of the mm -hmm. Marshall Plan, but the Marshall Plan helped the uh, European countries get back on their feet again after, after uh, being, being devastated by war. Mm -hmm. All of our allies were given monies to recover. Mm -hmm. And that also meant that we had uh, a tremendous amount of traffic after World War II. Mm -hmm. And it was also before the, the days of uh, jet travel, jet aircraft uh, flying across the ocean. We had huge, big passenger ships. Each country had its own representative of passenger ships. Have you heard of the Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth from, Elizabeth, from uh, uh, England? They were English ships, and each each allied nation of ours had its own fleet of passenger boats, and those passenger boats were famous. Every ship, well, I just mentioned two. Uh, France had the France. Uh, and I was fortunate enough to be pilot of all of those big, huge, big passenger ships. Wow. And New York was a very, very, very busy place, right up to 19, uh, the busiest part after the war, which came in 50, 1950, 51, 52. We reached our peak in the tonnage in and out of New York. Today, New York, that kind of uh, moving of cargo is all done by containers, container ships, uh, containers that can go on the highway. Oh, huh? Boxes, boxes that they call, call, call containers. And uh, instead of putting the cargo in, in the hull of a ship loose and pulling it out by crane, they put it in, in a box and they can stack these boxes up 
inside of a ship. And they can carry today as many as, well, you've seen, you know what the, the, what the tractor trailer looks like? Mm -hmm. The tra trailer that, well, yeah. that track, that box that the tractor pulls can be lifted off the wheels and set in a ship, in a, in a, in a, in a cell in a ship. And those ships are called container ships. Uh, during the during wartime, did you have any uh, happy or fond memories of that, of uh, when you served? Uh, no, I wouldn't say we were in ha in happy. There weren't very many happy moments because the, the whole the United States, the whole country, gave its effort over the war effort. Everyone was doing something toward the war effort. Mm -hmm. Have you heard the expression, Rosie the Riveter? Yep. Okay, that started because not only men, the able-bodied men, went off to war or served in the uh, Army, Navy, Coast Guard, Air Force, or Marines, mm -hmm. whatever. That, those that were left behind uh, were devoted to the war effort, mm -hmm. including the women. They went into the war. We, we turned our entire country over to building uh, materials and building tanks and building uh, ships. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, we had the, the most significant rail system in the United States. Mm -hmm. We shipped, this is before the days of interstate highways as you know them today. Mm -hmm. uh, Interstate highways uh, came after, uh, in the Eisenhower administration, way after the war. Okay. Um, do you have any... Uh, do it was all done by train, by train, train. Yeah. rail. Uh, do you have any particular stories you'd like to, you'd like to tell that you, uh, uh, that you remember the best? Well, I can tell you a, a story of, uh, of how I got my medal. Uh, uh, one of the boats that I was served as a captain, my first command was a two-masted wooden schooner that uh, was taken into the pilot service to act as a pilot boat, and uh, I was uh, on watch uh, on this wooden pilot boat with an auxiliary diesel engine, a big heavy diesel engine, when an explosion of a destroyer that was laying at anchor uh, exploded. It, it, the magazine, the, the place where they stored all the ammunition mm -hmm. for this destroyer, blew up. And it cut the ship directly in half. It blew up from the waterline like a big V. It, it blew the house, the, it blew the wardroom, which was on the second deck, and then it blew the wheelhouse, the smokestack, the antennas, everything. The ship was just a cut right in half and caught a fire. So that it was, a, and the ship was laying to an anchor. Fortunately, it was a flat, calm day at sea. I brought my wooden hull pilot schooner alongside and took off as many uh, survivors mm -hmm. as I could. Now, this was in the middle of February very, very cold water, and uh, we had, as I approached, the thing was only three miles away from me and I, when I was on patrol, it was only three miles away, and I went full speed over to, and put a line out alongside, and uh, put my two-masted two wooden schooner right alongside of the ship with one line and worked slowly ahead and to keep myself alongside of this. And I took every, everyone off 
on the stern end of the ship because the bow end of the ship was completely separated. Uh, there was only one, op one officer, one on the bow, and one on the stern, and they couldn't communicate with one another because no, it was fire. It was a fire. So I went alongside. Uh, she exploded, and I immediately ran full speed to the three miles away. Uh, didn't take long. And tied up alongside and took the crew off the stern of the destroyer. While up in the bow, men were jumping overboard to get rid of the fire. Get, get away from the fire. And the water was 38 degrees. Mm -hmm. Middle of February. And uh, another boat landed up by the bow or picked up another uh, uh, Coast Guard boat that was in, in the, in the vicinity from, from Sandy Hook. Uh, came alongside and took care of the men on the bow. I put my lifeboats over, my two boats and the crew of the, my two boats uh, picked up people who were in the water, had been blown overboard, and they were all in a state of shock. And uh, I took all these men off the, off the stern, and then uh, there was another explosion, a small explosion, which was the fuel tanks and, uh, of the destroyer. And uh, now I'm surrounded by oil, and I said, this is no place for me to be with a wooden boat if that oil catches a fire. So I cut the, the line that was holding me, uh, and I sped. I went head as fast as I could up to uh, my base at Pier 18, Staten Island, inside the Narrows. And I took, I don't, I don't, never recorded how many men I had on board. It was somewhere between 50 and 60 men. I called ahead on the ships on my radio phone and got as many uh, ambulances as I could to come down because all these men were in, a, in, a, in shock. Mm -hmm. Some of them were badly burned. And uh, so I got as many as uh, ambulances to come down to the dock where I was based, Pier 18, Staten Island. And uh, they took them up to the Marine Hospital, which was only a block or two away. Mm -hmm. And uh, for that, I received the uh, for that I received the medal from the Navy, mm -hmm. not not from the Coast Guard, but from the Navy, because it was a Navy ship. Um, did you receive any other medals, or? Uh uh, decorations? Well, I had I, those medals up there. One is for uh, uh, the Atlantic Theater, the other is for uh, uh, Victory Medal, and uh, my honorable discharge from the Coast Guard. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, where were you on, uh, on Pearl Harbor? Pearl Harbor, I was sitting in uh, the polo grounds in Manhattan watching a giant Brooklyn Dodgers National Football League game. Uh, and that Pearl Harbor was at one of, uh, was at daybreak, and it was at 1 o'clock p.m. in New York, and uh, they purposely did not announce that there was an attack on Pearl Harbor for fear there'd be a riot in the stadium watching this football game, professional football game. Mm -hmm. So they didn't announce. It wasn't until we got out on the street that we found out that Pearl Harbor had been attacked. And I immediately took a tremendous hate
for every Japanese person that I ever it was a sneak attack. Mm -hmm. So I classified every Japanese as a sneak. I felt very, very badly about that. It was sneaky. I hated every... Mm -hmm. I got over that. I don't, I don't keep a grudge. Because we are now very friendly with Japan. Um, how did you feel when uh, FDR died in 1945? I can't hear you. Uh, how did you feel when FDR died in 1945? Oh, I was very, very uh, upset about that. Uh, FDR, uh, people forget that FDR was the, was the uh, governor of New York State before he became president of the United States. Mm -hmm. So I was quite familiar with FDR, uh, what he did for New York State. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I knew he was going to be a, uh, a good leader, mm -hmm. and it turns out he was a good leader. Was, he was uh, something that can't happen today. He was elected for his third mm -hmm. term. Today, you can only be elected two terms. Mm -hmm. But it's a good thing he did. He, uh, luckily, the man who filled his shoes when he died was... Harry Truman, and uh, Harry Truman was vice president, he took over when the president died, uh, was elected on his own, and he made a, a good president mm -hmm. following the war. Okay, um, how, many, how many pilots would you say there are today? Uh, today there are about 60 pilots. 60 pilots? And uh, you said there were there were more during wartime than there are. Yes, there was more. We took in more. We we, we made pilots. Yes. Okay. Um, how many uh, how many ships do you think you've piloted back in the uh, back in the war war years? During the war? Yeah. Uh, I uh, I was not a pilot. I was serving my apprenticeship. I was on a pilot boat. Okay. I was the first pilot made after World War II. Okay. The very first pilot made. Okay. So as, as I say, I, I got my full license when I was uh, uh, 19, what did I just say? The year, was I saying the year? Um, I lost track of what my, my train of thought, excuse me. Go ahead. Yes. Okay. Um, um, could you give me like a uh, a personalized story? Like, um, what was some of the you know exciting things that you went through during uh, you know the time you served? We're talking about war effort or after the war? During the war. Dur just during the war. Okay. Uh, during the war. I was a captain of a uh, of a wooden two-masted schooner with big auxiliary power, and it was the, it was the third pilot boat. In other words, we always have backup. There's a main pilot boat that's on station out at the pilot station out at the entrance to New York Harbor. Then there's a, uh, two backup boats, and I was the third backup boat. Okay. And uh, that, that boat was used to transport pilots to and from the shore and the pilot station. Mm -hmm. Now the shore base was Pier 18 on Staten Island. So pilots that were assigned to, to, to go to sea to take care of inbound ships, they would come aboard my my boat and I'd ferry boat them out there one way and then they'd be, go transfer over to the boat that was on station and then be ready to take us to be. It rarely, New York Harbor very rarely balanced. There were so many ships outbound one day 
and so many ships in. Mm -hmm. So, and it, it rarely balanced, uh, it rarely balanced in a 24 hour period. So you had to keep adding to if they ran short of, of uh, uh, two way traffic. I don't put anything on until. Well, that's, I'm talking about Pete's time now. That's, that wouldn't affect you. you. You want what happened in wartime. Uh, in wartime, outbound uh, pilots would get on board of a ship either at the dock or at anchor and go out through this net gate that I spoke of and get off the pilot boat and uh, get off on the pilot station. As the pilot station, for general, your general knowledge, Mm -hmm. is 22 miles below the battery in Manhattan, 22 okay. nautical miles from the battery to the pilot station. But from the Narrows down, it was uh, 18 miles okay. down to the, to the pilot station mm -hmm. through Am Ambrose Channel, a big channel that was dredged by uh, so dressed to a depth of, uh, of uh, 45 feet. <laughs> and uh, right now they're in the process of deepening the, today they're right in the process of deepening the channel to 50 feet. Is it just because the ships, you know, they're Because the, dead, the container ships today are much bigger. Okay. Deeper. Mm -hmm. Um, did you ever see any, um, did you see any, did you ever see any action with the, uh, with the German submarines? I had a German submarine come up right alongside of me. I was laying, uh, uh, I was on patrol in this wooden hull boat that I'm talking about, the Wanderer. Uh, CGR 1904 was her number. Uh, but uh, she kept her name Wanderer. Uh, I was laying on, on patrol one night, and this doggone submarine came right up alongside of me at night, right up alongside of me. With the, I just heard this big, whoosh, and there was a there was a sub. Later on, I read after the war uh, an account of a of a German captain said he came in they were picking off ships like sitting ducks mm -hmm. the early part of the war uh, uh, we were ill prepared our country was ill prepared for uh, for uh, uh, going to war mm -hmm. and this, they sent roving subs over here uh, early on, uh, only in the first nine months of the of the war, this happened that they sent submarines over, and I had a and they sunk ships all all, all up and down the the coast of of, of uh, New Jersey before the days of blackouts along the coast. Mm -hmm. the, the, the country went into a blackout. We had uh, air 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 alarms that, uh, during the war that uh, said put out all your lights. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> why didn't uh, why didn't we go into uh, blackout earlier? Because uh, you know we knew the subs would come on over. Uh, we caught we caught wise to that fact because before the blackout the submarine the German subs would come over not in packs they were independent and they'd come over and the whole Jersey coastline was alighted and all of Long Island was all all, all ablaze with lights and so they would those roving subs would pick out it was like a sitting duck 
here were these ships going past, all illuminated by the lights from the shore, and they could pick and choose which ship that they could, they could torpedo. And they were like sitting ducks. Now this didn't get into the, the general public in the United States was not aware of this, but I was aware of it because I was a pilot. Mm -hmm. How did you How did you feel about the uh, the when Truman dropped the atomic bomb on uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki? Well, I I I felt uh, I felt uh, I felt two ways. I said, well, good. We, we finally stopped, it stopped the war immediately. That, that was the good part of it. But when I saw uh, the publications of what the, the destruction that the thing did, mm -hmm. then I was appalled. I, thank God, we hope we never use that atomic bomb again. Yeah. And we haven't, not would. <coughs> that was a terrible, terrible blast. Yeah. Uh, during the war, uh, during the war, uh, did you have uh, a lot of a lot of friends that were that were with you, like other uh, other pilot friends? Oh or, uh, yes, yes. Every pilot knows every other pilot because they're so few and they're so. Uh, see, every port in the world has its mm -hmm. own pilot organization, and that's a, a required. International law says you must take a pilot. Okay. But you have to start by being a captain first. Mm -hmm. Then you can be a pilot. Okay. All, all pilots throughout the world are captains first, and then they're made, in, made to be pilots. A lot of them are deep sea captains. Okay. But in, in, our, in New York's case, they have a special system regulated by the state of New York on how to train pilots. And I went through all that training. Mm -hmm. uh, could you go, could you uh, uh, quick go over that training for us? The training? Well, you do, you do everything from a deckhand, start as a deckhand, mm -hmm. and as I said, you start as a deckhand and you work your way up Third mate, second mate, first mate, captain, and then pilot, and then and then and then and then you're eligible to become a pilot. Mm -hmm. All captains throughout the world, all pilots rather, are captains first. Okay. Are are draw draw their. Um, to be from captain. Did you have any family members in the, also in the? In the service? During yes, the war? I did. Uh, okay. uh, a typical day for a pilot in peacetime after the war. Go to the go from home to the office when you could, and we work in a in a by turn. Uh, when your turn comes up, you're called into the office. You are assigned. You are assigned a ship two hours before sailing time, and you're given two hours to get from your office, which is right central to, to New York Harbor, so up on uh, Pier 18, Staten Island. You're assigned a ship, and you're given two hours to get to that ship tied up at the dock or at an anchor. At the given sailing time, the ship sails, and you take the ship out through the channels and on out to the sea. When you get out to the sea, there is a two pilot boats. One is a living pilot hotel called a pilot cutter, and then there's another pilot boat which is a specially built launch to go alongside of the ship with a rope ladder hanging down over it, and you turn, get out into the open sea where the pilot station is, and you tell the captain that you're gonna, you're, you're, he's on your own, you're on your own, and climb down a rope ladder into 
a pilot launch. The pilot launch then takes you over to the pilot cutter, which is a living hotel at Steve, that's on station, out in the ocean, called a pilot cutter. So if you know that there are predicted... There you eat, sleep, and relax, do whatever you want, until your turn comes up, and the next ship that comes up over the horizon is your ship to take in, and you reverse the project. You go from the pilot boat into the launch, they drop a ladder over the side of the ship. On the lee side, the ship stops to about three knots, slows down. You climb up the ladder, go up on the bridge of the ship, and take the ship into the harbor to her berth. That's a, 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 that would be a, a, a ship out one day, a, a, a wait out at sea overnight, and a ship in the next day. And then the, the third day you would get the, the third day off. Okay. That's in peacetime. It was far different during the wartime effort okay. because we were always working with convoys. There were some ships that came in independently of, of, uh, of convoy movements. One was the maiden voyage of the Queen Mary when she arrived in New York. She was came in, and she ran across the sea from England to to uh, United States, New York, independently. She was not part of a convoy. She was so fast, and she ran zigzags. She could outrun a, a submarine, and she ran a what they call a zigzag course. They changed course. So that if a sub spotted her, she could literally outrun a sub. She went so fast. So she came into New York Harbor independently. Um, that was during the war. During the war? Um, <coughs> now, you mainly, you, uh, have you, did you ever come in contact with, uh, you know, Germans like face to face? Did you ever, uh, uh, capture any or um, no, no. I, did not, no. I only, only know that a sub surface next to me. The submarine, the submarines that they had sent over from Germany at that time. They had electric power, mm -hmm. and they had diesel power. Now, in in the uh, at night time, they would come up, so they couldn't be spotted in the air. They surface, and they generate their batteries. Mm -hmm. And then at daybreak or before dark, they'd submerge again. Now they're operating their propellers strictly on batteries. Not with diesel, because they're submerged. They, a diesel engine has to have air. Okay. So they submerge. And they operate off these electric batteries. But they would put themselves in position uh, in daylight where they want it to be, and then just rest submerged. They, yeah. They'd even go down and just lay on the bottom. They could do that. Just just to wait for an attack on the coast, or or, or they can they could suspend themselves somewhere. Mm -hmm. Okay. <coughs> now, uh, you were saying about the uh, the rope ladder, how you'd have to climb aboard that. Yes. What um, were there any people that would uh, maybe, you know? Yes, there were. That was a very dangerous uh, maneuver. Oh, we had uh, we have lost pilots uh, overboard transferring from that pilot launch to the pilot ladder. It's a very ticklish uh, operation because it, uh, the ship would slow down to three knots, about three knots, 
and the launch could come alongside mm -hmm. and you'd climb up and, and uh, take charge of the ship. Now that could be done in all kinds of weather. Mm -hmm. Don't forget, we're talking about a pilot business. <laughs> During the war, 365 days a year, year round. Now what kind of weather would you get in New York Harbor in a year's time? What kind of weather have we got today? <laughs> Pilots are still boarding ships mm -hmm. out at sea right now, today. And it's 16 degrees out. Yeah. Um, what was the normal, like, uh, dress that she would wear? Like, uh... We wore suits. Business suits. Suits. Business suit and a hat. Really? But just like a businessman going to the office. That's a... Pilots do not wear uniform. Um... Uh, <clears throat> and they, uh, because they were in the Coast Guard during the war, mm -hmm. we were all in the Coast Guard, we all had uniform. Okay. Uh, can you tell us, uh, like... During the war, my rank, ranking as a, a uh, Coast Guardman, I was ranked as a chief bosun's mate. Okay. This is the highest rank that a non-commissioned officer can get. I was, the, I was the highest. I was not a commissioned officer. I was not a lieutenant, lieutenant commander, or any of those. I didn't have any gold. Gold stripes. Um, uh, could you go any farther with that, with your rank, or was that... What's that? Could you go any farther with your rank? Could you, could you get up into the uh, commissioned officers? Or? Uh, all the pilots were commissioned officers. They were, they were, the pilots that were during the war mm -hmm. were ranked as uh, lieutenant commanders. Okay. Uh, were you ever on a, uh, a combat vessel? Many times. Uh, did you ever... What did you do on those? Uh, my skill as a pilot came to, to place with one instant. I, I was pilot of the flat top Intrepid. Okay. A huge, big uh, flat top. And uh, I got aboard the ship uh, out at sea on the pilot station and uh, on the way up this ship was bound for the Brooklyn Navy Yard the Intrepid was bound for the Brooklyn Navy Yard now they had to have a special conditions to go up the East River with that ship it's a very very swift current in the East River mm -hmm. and uh, it also had to do two things. They had to worry about clearing the Brooklyn Bridge and about the draft of the ship hitting the bottom under the Brooklyn Bridge. So you had to thread the needle. And they had to do this in, at the right time. Well, the weather forecast was for high winds okay. for the day. And when I got aboard the ship, it was not windy out at sea. I went aboard the Intrepid. Now the Intrepid wheelhouse is way over on the side of the sh outside of the hull of the ship. In other words, the hull has all is all landing space for aircraft. Mm -hmm. So that your wheelhouse, the pilot house, the place where you're going to pilot from. Again, I climbed aboard by a ladder out at sea, and I was given the warning that if the wind picked up too much between my run up the channel to put the ship to an anchor off Staten Island in a regular anchorage, there was a space reserved for this maneuver because the ship was coming. Now she's a thousand feet overall. You could put the Queen Mary and the Queen Elizabeth 
on her deck together, side by side, and nothing would hang over. That's wow. how big the top is of that trip. Now, on the way up to the channel, I get up to the Narrows, and they said, put the ship to an anchor, we have a space reserved off the anchorage for you to put that ship until until the wind calms down. And uh, they told me, they showed me where where they had it on the ship itself. Okay. They had a chart and showed exactly where they wanted the ship. And I said, okay. So I came up and I put the ship to an anchor off Staten Island and the space they had reserved, I came within 100 feet of where they had designated this ship to be anchored. Okay. <laughs> That's what you call skill. <laughs> That's what all the training's for, right? Now, could, like you say, in the, I'm, I'm going to park my car out in this, in this huge big parking lot. Mm -hmm with no lines on it. But I had... That's what a pilot does. Okay. He's responsible for the ship's position all the time he's there. Okay. Um, were there any times you missed, you missed the spot or uh, you got in trouble for uh, parking in the wrong spot? Did I ever get in trouble? Uh, well, a pilot can can have his uh, can be have his pay suspended mm -hmm. for how, for how if he's found negligent if he's found to be negligent in his duty uh, a board of, will have a hearing coast guard and the state board of pilots would have a hearing and to find out if you're, you've been negligent in your duties. And uh, you could be suspended, your license could be suspended for a month or a year or taken away from you altogether. <laughs> so there is a governing body over you looking over you. You've got to do your, you, you have to do your, uh, in, in the case of uh, during the war, uh, the Navy then took, if you, if you didn't do it right, we st we're still under the, uh, under the license of a, uh, of New York State. Mm -hmm. I, I worked for, uh, under the guidance, uh, under the guidelines of a pilot commission, New York Pilot Commission. Okay. They can revoke your license or promote your license. Whatever mm -hmm. they are responsible for your progress as an apprentice pilot and as uh, a, a governing body to see that there's no negligence okay. on your part. There is a there is another word, there is a governing body. You're not completely uh, on your own. You could get in trouble if you don't perform correctly. Mm -hmm. huh. The pilot association, pilot business, is governed by the state of New York and New Jersey. They license the pilots. But uh, in the case of in the case of war, which we were in, mm -hmm. uh, The uh, Coast Guard took took over the the, 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 the the business lock, stock, and barrel. They took over the pilot business. It was, it was exactly the same as in peacetime it was during the war. It's called an essential industry. Mm -hmm. There were certain industries during the wartime uh, that were called essential industries. 
that could op operate it regardless of what the war conditions were okay. and the conditions of sh uh, uh, and throughout the country were. Uh, was your family disrupted at all because of the war? Or was this, uh, you know? No, uh, I, I had a father and a brother who were both pilots along both with pilots. me. And uh, we all served together in the Coast Guard during during the war. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, after the war, you carried out your, uh, you know, being a pilot? Till, uh, after the war, we went right back to what we were doing originally anyway. It was just a matter of, the only thing different was that the traffic was different. Mm -hmm. During the war wartime, it was military traffic. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was ships, but under military command, under the command of the, of, of the military. Okay. <clears throat> these merchant ships, these ships that were loaded with uh, cargo, all different sizes. Uh, I think I said before, every time I went to work, I went to work on a different nationality yep. and a different ship, size ship. Uh, could you tell us a uh, uh, one of your peacetime stories? A peacetime story? Yeah. I can tell you a funny story, or I was assigned during peacetime to a uh, an Italian ship, empty uh, diesel powered. Italian freighter to take the ship out of Port Newark and down Newark Bay to Kill Van Cull, Arthur Kill, and up to the upper bay and the lower bay and out to sea. Well, this is a story of me deliberately putting a ship aground. <laughs> uh, why was that? Now, a pilot, I said, was a walking encyclopedia of what the ship, what the harbor looks like. Okay. Within inches, you can, you can show you. This ship was a diesel ship, and the tide was ebb. The current was running ebb. So, and it was a, uh, there was a, uh, a bridge, a lift bridge for for the, uh, the ship to go through and underneath this lift bridge. Well, I was coming down Newark Bay, which I knew was all mud on either side. You have to know the condition of the bottom everywhere you're a pilot. You have to know what, whether it's mud, sand, shale, or rock. It can be any of those four things. Okay. I knew that this was mud. So I can't, left the ship and the captain of the ship warned me, he said, we just, we were adjusting some things down in the engine room of this diesel and uh, we have, we have run trials tied up at the dock. In other words, they put extra ropes out mm -hmm. and started the engine and she stayed right in place. So they ran this test ashore and started the engine and it worked. So I, I was told this when I came aboard the ship to take the ship out to sea in Port Newark. And I also knew that the channel was 400 feet wide and on each side of the channel was mud. So I sailed the ship down and it was going very, very slowly and I had the tide with me at the same time. And because of this uh, condition with the engine, I said, I'm going to keep the tug, the tug that came alongside to help us away from the dock, pull us away from the dock. And, and 
and I said, I'm going to keep the tug. So I put the tug, I had the tug tied up on a port bow, and I was really towing the tugboat with me. Now, the tug is on the left side of the ship, and the, there's mud on both sides of the ship. And I, as I made the turn and got straightened out in the channel, the engine room called up and says, we have to stop the engine. I said, okay. I said, I'm glad I kept the tug. Stopped the ship and we were going and going slow anyway. Uh, And they said, uh, I said, uh, after a while, I said, you better hurry up. When am I going to get the engine? And they kept saying, can't have it. Dude. I said, well, we've got to do something to myself. So I said, I'll give you five, five, I'll give you five more minutes. I said, I'll give you four more minutes. I'll give you three more minutes. I'll give you two more minutes. I'll give you one more minute. Each time I said, as you were going, and then when they come back said, no, we can't you? I said to the tugboat, okay, push. And the tugboat, the tide was behind me. We're going down with the tide with a dead engine. The tugboat pushed the bow into the mud, right into the mud. Now, it was four, uh, 35 feet in the channel, and where the tug was, was 24 feet. So I knew the tug would float. Okay. So here I come down the channel, the tug pushed me, and pushed the nose right into the bow, right into the mud, and because if it was ebb tide, the stern of the ship swung around. Here, if I pushed it, now I'm broadside to the channel, and broadside to the current. So the ship, just like a swinging door, hit the mud and swung around like this. And we stayed there, stuck in the mud. Now the, the tugboat was floating, 24 feet of water, mm -hmm. and I was aground with the bow. Mm -hmm. Finally, they said, okay, we got the engine. So I said to the tug, push. So the tug pushed the the ship off in the mud, and I put, used the rudder, and we, together, I, I, I actually, if the ship is laying against the bank of mud, she's laying like against the mm -hmm. bank. Now, I had to put the, the tug was pushing on the bow, and I put the rudder so that the stern would come off. So I got the bow, the tug pushing on the bow, and the, the rudder over hard over to the left to make the stern go off, right? Mm -hmm. And then as the stern came off, then I put the rudder back amidships and steered the ship back up, put, put right back up to where we started from. <coughs> so I, 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 that was my job. That was finished. I was finished. Mm -hmm. That was a peacetime job. Mm -hmm. um, There's just some strange experiences I've had. Uh, were there any wartime experiences like that? Uh, well, I wasn't a pilot during the war. Mm -hmm. I was only an apprentice. I was mm -hmm. part of the Coast Guard service, pilot service. Mm -hmm. <coughs> dur dur during the war, I have to take that back. Let me get my story straight now. Oh, you want to turn it off? As a pilot apprentice, you work your way up from from uh, up as an apprentice. Now. This is a the, the apprentices man the pilot boats, mm -hmm. not pilots. The pilot boats are manned. The deck department is manned by the deckhands 
uh, the mates are all apprentice pilots. They are all, they're not pilots yet, but they're in their apprenticeship. They're serving as crew of the pilot boat. So, I was still, this is why the apprenticeship takes so darn long. Because you go through so many different stages. It's, uh, even today, in today's, you have to be a graduate of, uh, a graduate of a nautical school. Mm -hmm. You have to have four degrees, four year degree in uh, nautical science, which you can get from the certain uh, nautical schools. But uh, it just shortens their apprenticeship up. Okay. And my apprenticeship was by stage. <laughs> I went from a, 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 a deckhand to a third mate to a captain. And we were the crew of the pilot boat that was on station out in the ocean. So we also manned the launches. That launch that you see going alongside of the Queen Mary on that picture up there. Mm -hmm. that, that's what a typical pilot launch looked like back in those days. Today there, they look like that other picture that I showed you, like that. Like that. Okay. That's what they look like today. High speed. Mm -hmm. They board a ship now at 10 miles an hour, whereas when we had that, that, that type of launch there, they would slow down to about 3 miles an hour ships. Why the, why the difference in speed? Just because of the... Uh, the well, because our, uh, our knowledge and our uh, equipment we, we did this all by trial and error. Mm -hmm. We did it originally by, by yaw, by pulling a, a yaw. <coughs> that, that kind of a pilot boat, put, put, you put that white, see the white boat on mm -hmm. deck there? Yep. That's called the yaw boat. They put that yaw boat in the water. And the pilot would get into the, go from the pilot boat into the yaw boat and Two guys had roar over to the ship and they'd climb up the ladder. Wow. And that, this is the way you do it today. That picture there and that mug. Okay. okay. I've never been I've never been on one of those. I've oh, been really? retired so long, yeah. Hmm. I retired in 70, uh, 78, 1978. I piloted my last ship. Oh, no. uh, what was the name of that ship when you retired? Pardon me? What was the name of that ship when you retired? The ship that I had? Mm -hmm. I have to remember the name of the ship. It was called the uh, Greta Maersk. That was a Danish ship and it was a container ship. Oh, really? Yeah. <coughs> okay, well... Uh, Thanks a lot for your time. You're welcome. And uh, glad you could come. Okay.